Welcome to Blue Club. My name's John Sherman and I'm here with my friend Dr Nick Ford and we're going to have a yarn about post-traumatic stress disorder. Hey John, it's a great pleasure and honour to be here. Thanks Nick. Nick, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, names for it down the years, there's a million of them. What, what's the history behind post-traumatic stress disorder? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of things about that. The first one is the names. Battle fatigue, soldier's heart, shell shock, they tend to refer to soldiers and soldiers have kind of been the lab rats of this area. We've learned a lot from soldiers, but we've learned that this disorder extends to a whole bunch of other people, particularly first responders and police. The history of it's amazing. Um, we've forgotten so much or choose to forget so much. The earliest description I've got is 500 BC, a guy at the Battle of Marathon. It's not just a Western thing. It's referred to in the Indian epic poem, the Mahabharata. It's referred to in Chinese literature. So this condition, this disorder, has been with us for thousands of years. The early physicians, Hippocrates and Galen, 200 BC. They used to talk about it. So the different names don't affect the way we deal with it? The different names don't affect how we deal with it to a point. Some of the things that are really valuable, and I think we're going to talk about this, is in selected groupings, police and military, you are part of a grouping. And so using the group as one of the vehicles to help people recover becomes really important. If you listen to news reports and immerse yourself in contemporary popular culture, you would have it that post-traumatic stress disorder is very common. In reality, how common is it in our society, for instance? <clears throat> Say Australian society, about 2% of the population. But if you drill down into particular groupings, people have been through a bushfire, um, soldiers have been to Afghanistan, the proportions will rise. In really war-torn countries, such as the Congo, rates measured at 40%. Um, similarly in Iraq, 40 or 50 per cent. In this population, relatively low. The other thing that's really important is not to get messed up with PTSD when what a person's going through to a traumatic event is actually a normal reaction, because normal reactions do occur. Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, but we're here, essentially, to, to talk to cops. Um, if you work as a cop, um, is PTSD inevitable? Um, it's certainly very likely at some point in a policeman's career that this will happen because of the nature of the policing, because of the nature of the individual and because of the level of group support. It's not inevitable, but it's certainly a high risk. And I would suggest that if you do get a psychological injury from your work, um, it doesn't mean you're soft, it means you're human. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, There's a study about that too, it goes back to 1939, but it's a long one. It was the best and brightest who were picked up who wound up with PTSD after World War II. Why is that? I think partly the best and brightest were the ones who were picked for the most challenging jobs. So you had some individuals who were highly neurotic and they wound up with PTSD from all sorts of things, um, just life in general. But the best and brightest were those who were propelled into the highest risk jobs. So, so post-traumatic stress disorder, um, is it purely psychological or is it physiological? And I suppose what I'm asking is if you had an MRI of the brain or whatever it is, can you identify damage areas? Absolutely. Um, better imaging 20 or 30 years ago with MRI imaging, which is like using a microscope compared to a looking glass for um, looking down at, at an object, um, shown to be damaged to the memory areas, that those memory areas shrink. We're talking about resolutions of 0.5 to 1 millimetre. One of the really cool things that's happened is brain imaging where you can actually see the metabolic activity, the activity of the brain, different areas of the brain doing different things. What we do is we operate between a whole bunch of structures that are in action depending on what we're doing. If you have a friendly chat with a friend, 
one set of structures will be activated. If you're trying to solve a maths problem or write up a, an offence sheet, another set of structures will activate. In a healthy brain, you go from one structure to another seamlessly and quickly. With PTSD, one of those structures is stuck. Hmm. Um, it, it seems to me that, that, that all of us in life have to confront you know, stressful and traumatic episodes. Um, how, how is PTSD different from a normal reaction to a, a traumatic or a stressful event in our lives? Yeah. The short answer is the length of time those symptoms continue and the severity. You're right, we do confront stressful episodes in our life and one of the things is stress is fun to a point. We enjoy solving problems, we enjoy getting excited, we enjoy the, 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 the value of getting over something. And so when we encounter something problematic that we haven't encountered before, that maybe produces affects of fear, horror and disgust, what will usually happen is the brain will get flooded a little bit by those recollections, those images, then it'll block it out and we'll try and get on with stuff. And what you'll find is those memories and, and blockouts will gradually settle down over two or three months. So if you've got, you know, the commonly accepted symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, which we'll talk a bit down, down the track, uh, and you have them for a couple of months, that's kind of okay, but anything longer than that, that'd be a red flag? Anything longer than that's a red flag. So when we're talking to med students or GPs and we say, like, there's a natural disaster, find those people in your population who you most worry about, probably try and get everybody else in, Give them some advice, but make sure they come back at two months to see how, whether those symptoms are still persisting. The other thing is in medicine, anything that starts bad and big time is probably going to persist. So you see individuals after a big event, you get people who are having nightmares, but nightmares severe enough to disrupt sleep that aren't settling down. Those dissociative flashbacks, not just a memory, but an actual sense around experience of what's happened that's also a bit of a warning sign. Feelings of detachment and numbing, hmm. that's not such a good sign as well. So those three things are indicators that this could move on to something pathological. Um, look, it, it seems to me um, that two people can go to a, um, the same traumatic episode, be exposed to the same traumatic episode. Um, just have a look at this. Major crash. You're up. Out of here. Okay, so Nick, so, you know, as you know, that's a, uh, a clip from the film we worked on together, Dark Blue. Um, now, Grant, the young cop, is profoundly affected by having to pull a dead kid out of a car, not unreasonably. Um, the female officer, the female commanding officer, not so much. What's going on here? Why does he 
get a psychological injury and she seems to be have a perfectly balanced response to this. So let's make a couple of suppositions. First is she's a senior officer. She's been through this situation before. She's seen this before. We don't know if she didn't have acute stress symptoms after she pulled her first body out of a car. Maybe she did. This is a horror show for him. This is a really difficult, challenging thing. He's a father of young kids. It is going to be distressing. What should happen at the end of that is he's taken back and said, mate, that was really tough. You did a great job and his experience validated. You do see people who are particularly vulnerable for particular circumstances. Parents with kids are often very vulnerable to crimes and issues involving kids. The other one is fatigue. As your brain and your body get worn down by constant shift work, lots of demands, there will come a time when the brain is no longer able to defend itself against the horror memories. Just want to have another look at something from Dark Blue. Dreaming about. It's a dream. Yes, you were. You woke us up. Baby woke us up. Grant, you have nightmares. Grant, maybe you should see a doctor. So in contemporary popular culture, you know, dreams and flashbacks are very readily associated by almost everybody with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. What's going on in the brain here? <clears throat> There's a whole bunch of things that happen in the brain that we'll talk about later. What you've got with PTSD is emotional memories that are encoded in a bit of the brain in a random order. Normally when we have a story, we, we we're able to tell a story from beginning to end in a logical fashion. With PTSD, the brain hasn't been able to make sense of those orders, those memories, so they come jumbling out in a distorted and, and chaotic form. One of the really spooky things about PTSD is to start with those memories are about the, the event in general. But as time goes by, the brain tries to adjust it into something that's familiar with, and so very often you'll find that that initial incident, say of a dead child or a big car accident, starts to involve friends and loved ones. So it's quite common as time goes on, and this really terrifies people, to start seeing people that you love in that car accident, or that's your child's body that you're pulling out. Is, so are the dreams and the flashbacks, are they part of the healing process? No. They've really gone too far. It's, when you've got those symptoms coming up, it's, it's like trying to do physiotherapy with a broken leg. It's just not going to work and it's going to hurt. I, I, we've talked before about um, my diagnosis um, with post-traumatic stress disorder quite a number of years ago now. And I remember there were physical symptoms as well as psychological ones. I have a very clear recollection of that. What, what are the symptoms, physical and psychological, that you look for when you're di diagnosing post-traumatic stress yeah. disorder? Honing in on the physical symptoms, what you've got is your fight or flight network misbehaving and pumping adrenaline through your body. So there's a whole bunch of uncomfortable things that happen. Heart flutters, palpitations, you become exquisitely sensitive to what's happening inside your body, plus your heart's beating extra fast anyway. Blood's being taken away from your stomach so you feel nausea, maybe you've got some diarrhea. You're sweating. The other thing that happens is your muscles, your skeletal muscles tighten up in the same way that they tighten up in getting ready for the school races when you're on the, the blocks. The trouble is they stay tightened up. So people tend to get a lot of aches and pains around the place. Usually around the neck, headaches are the common one, but if you've got a bit of arthritis, you'll have pain in those joints as well. Just, um, let's go back to dark blue. Why not? I can't leave this. Because I can go home. Grant, 
Grant. 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 I mean, this is not a, this is not about me, but I remember. Um, very clearly emotional numbness. Yeah. Um, I felt that nobody understood me, but I also remember being quite irrationally angry like Grant yeah. was when he kicked over the, the yeah. kids' toys. I mean, clearly he's not behaving well in the family home. How normal is that? Regrettably, it's really normal. Um, irritability is a really normal kind of fighting in post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, I can talk about numbness and irritability as well, but just honing in on irritability, the guy's world has been out of control. He's experienced something that's out of control and he's just not dealing with it. Guys, when you move into these high-risk situations, like things to be in control. They like things to be ordered. Now, from his point of view, his mind, his world is out of control. The kid's toys on the floor, somebody could slip, all sorts of things could happen. He's not able to control that. For him, that is really bigger than Ben-Hur. So his response is to fly off the handle like that. That obviously creates secondary problems because the wife's not going to be happy with that, she's going to be withdrawn, his kid's going to be a little bit frightened, he's going to start to feel rejected, and you can see how this illness actually digs its own hole. Yeah. Um, I was also thinking about near misses. Hmm. Can you get post-traumatic stress disorder from a near miss? You can. The, the diagnostic criteria say that you see an event or see something that causes affects of disgust, horror and fear. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot is the second guessing. What if? What if this had happened? What happened? Didn't happen. One of the things that, I guess a comment that I often make is you point out to somebody that when there has been a near miss, that they begin to second guess what if this had happened. And you point out to them, in fact, it didn't happen. And it didn't happen because very often their skill set, their way of responding to that crisis meant the horrible thing didn't happen. But of course, people go burrowing into the, the negative. So that, that's often a useful reminder. What about the, you know, the, the, the drip, 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 the relentless, like, lower level stresses? I mean, can that precipitate post-traumatic stress disorder? <clears throat> the diagnostic rules say that you've got to have experienced an event that is accompanied by fear, horror, disgust and affect. The thing that we see is that that slow drip drip, let's say, of administrative burdens, that will tend to morph toward depression as such. Very often what we see with, with coppers is there is a drip drip of low key trauma events gradually wearing down a person's resolve and ability particularly if there are problems in bonding with the group or the group's management or the group's command, and then something comes along. And that something may actually seem trivial, but when you go burrowing back into the guy's history, you'll find that there is a history of big time trauma exposure. One of the really unfortunate things we see is often declaration is when there's been a disciplinary issue, that the, the cop has done something and he attracts disciplinary attention. Very often, but not always, because, you know, there's certainly some people who do some bad things, but when you burrow back, you will find that history in a lot of people. What about um, PTSD from listening to other people's stories? <clears throat> Among us, um, the idea of vicarious trauma, that we become traumatised by hearing these stories, is said to occur. What about you? Personally, it doesn't worry me. Um, I've had been what I call out horrid on two occasions, both by soldiers. The rest of the time, it doesn't bother me. In both of those cases, I went back to them the next session and said, mate, what you told me really got under my skin. What's it like being back in your head? And that enabled a lot of things to come out. That was really quite useful. One of the things that you do see that comes up, may I say, probably more in detectives than patrols, is they get to burrow into a person's life. They get to know the victim and the family very closely, and that can start to prey on them over time. Yeah, so there is such a thing as referred or vicarious trauma. Is it post-traumatic stress disorder or is it something else? 
it usually morphs as a depression. It usually morphs not into post-traumatic stress disorder as such, it usually morphs into a depression where a person becomes kind of horrified at the things that life can do. Mm. I remember speaking to a, um, a Vietnam veteran mate yep. who explained to me about about hypervigilance. He mm. had been uh, in Vietnam for a year um, and other than the times when he was actually like safe behind the wire, they were outside in a guerrilla war environment. They didn't mm. know where the enemy was or who was going to come at them when yep. and how. Um, he talked about hypervigilance and when he came back he was hypervigilant for years. What is hypervigilance? Remember we talked about the, hype, the fight or flight getting stuck? Hypervigilance in a combat situation, hypervigilance going into a suspected offender's house, hypervigilance uh, approaching a, a car accident is adaptive. It's what's necessary in that situation. What do you mean adaptive? It's adaptive. It helps. It helps if you're paying attention to where the bad guys might be. It helps when you're approaching an accident to see if the petrol's dripping, see if there are any flames around, see where the people are actually lying and what they might need help. Your brain needs to be on high alert. So in that situation, your fight or flight centre is humming away quite happily. It's picking up a lot more data. The retina, the pupils are dilated. The retina are hyperactive. You're picking up a lot more information. Very handy. Is this a chemical reaction or a, yes. a, a psychological one? Tomato, tomato. It's a chemical reaction. It's a physiological action, re reaction. That bit of your brain has gotten hold of the apparatus that controls the eyes, that controls the muscles in the ear, so you hear better too. Um, everything is ramped up, ready to go. Is this the walnut? Yeah, this is the walnut. Right. Misbehaving. Actually, the walnut's doing exactly what it should in that situation. The problem with the persisting hypervigilance is that hypervigilance doesn't stop. One of the things you see in soldiers returning back from overseas deployments are, even in a normal reaction, they're hypervigilant usually for two or three months. Uh, and so they're wandering around the supermarket scanning for trouble. And then that gradually settles down because hypervigilance in an extreme environment is useful, it's adaptive. It's when it won't turn off, that's when you've got a problem. It's like Don Walker's song and um, K Sam and Car Parks Made Me Jumpy. Exactly, exactly right. And that's a brilliant song for. <clears throat> Personally, I think your song's better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I'll be sure to much, tell much Don. More, much more moving. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm assuming that post traumatic stress disorder is not a. a discrete condition. I'm thinking that perhaps it comes like bundled software. Yeah. <clears throat> that gets into a whole bunch of stuff about treatment studies, which I, I won't bore you with, but it's nearly always accompanied by depression, very often accompanied by substance abuse, usually alcohol, but it can be the benzos. Oddly enough, it can also be the amphetamines. Um, and the other thing that comes up is miscellaneous aches and pains because the muscles are tightened up and so people may be referred with pain disorders. The physicians are finding it difficult to find a cause for the guy's headaches, and I've seen this a few times, or the guy's neck problems. So those are the common things that pop up along with it. OK, so, so I've got post-traumatic stress disorder and I get referred to you. I come in mm. and I sit down and it's the first appointment. Mm. Like, what happens? <clears throat> Everybody's got a different style different way of approaching things. By the time that you get to a psychiatrist, such as myself, you've usually seen... Does that mean you're in trouble? To an extent. Sure. Yeah. You've usually seen two or three people. I guess in my practice, the patients that, um, that I wind up seeing have seen some really competent GPs that I'm lucky enough to work with, some really competent psychologists, and so they've come to see the psychiatrist. And yeah, you are in a bit of trouble, and yes, it can be scary. I guess I try and put people at ease. One of the things that I point out is I'm a psychiatrist, we ask lots of questions, and remind them that they're unlikely to meet anybody nosier than me. So then... <laughs> perfectly How do they respond to that? <laughs> Usually by doing just what you did, which is laugh. <laughs> and that's the point. Um, one of the things is to talk about the trauma, to talk about exactly what happened in detail at first meeting tends to be pretty destructive, and that's what the person's frightened of. And so I usually start by saying, look, we'll, we'll move into this and we'll move out of this. 
I guess a way of thinking about it is how you examine an abdomen when you're looking for appendicitis. You don't go ramming your el elbow into exactly the right point and say, does that hurt? Yeah, mercifully. No, you don't do that. You move around slowly, you just check, you work out where the sore points are and then you approach and then you move and then you back away depending on the patient's tolerance. Now one of the things I guess the patient gets from that is the idea that their distress is being paid attention to. Firstly, it's being taken seriously and secondly, this is not going to be a bulldoze into their brain and try and eradicate it, that we're going to move toward it to resolving it together. Now, I guess in my practice, I'm usually working with psychologists as well, and so it becomes a really a three-way process. Look, the other thing, I guess the line that I, I really like with patients is to say to them, you're not the problem. The problem is out there. The problem is a bit of wiring in your brain that isn't working so well at the moment. So that's the two of us sit down and see if we can pull it to pieces. Rewire it. Yeah, rewire it. And then what? Okay, so you've, so you've had the initial sort of chat and, and you've established a relationship. I mean, I'm hoping that, you know, if you get in to see somebody like you, it's not just a sort of a, a you know, friendly chat with somebody lying on a leather sofa. No leather sofa. No leather couches. <laughs> there is a particular type of therapy called psychoanalysis where that is done. It is not done for post-traumatic stress disorder and it's reserved for particular types of conditions. I do have a big leather armchair. Um, it's a leather armchair that's so that somebody can sit upright if they're feeling tense or they can sit back and relax if they, if they feel they need to. I guess at the first interview we're trying to gather data. We're trying to work out what other physical conditions might be going on, the extent of the symptoms. We're trying to work out, say, in a policeman, the command structure, the nature of the duties, because part of my job is to find out exactly what the person did. Now, as an example, a copper I was seeing, um, I thought he was a, an investigator and he'd been to Bosnia. I just thought maybe he set up traffic lights and, and p picked up drunken NATO soldiers. Turns out he was a war crimes investigator. Turns out a lot of those suspected mass graves were buried behind enemy lines. So that was quite an interesting thing to find out and very important for him. How long did it take him or how long did it take you in conversation with him to determine that? About 15 minutes. Oh, okay. He'd had symptoms for a good 15 years, that particular chap. Um, his career had, at that point, taken a massive downturn, and I'm pleased to say he's gone on to do quite well. Um, just, I'm, I'm sure you get the prescription pad out at some point in time. Let's just have a look at this. So there, Grant's wife, Karen, discovers the fact that he's on medication. She's obviously not happy about it, but, mm. but I'm sure that medication's an important part of what it is that you do. What do the tablets do? I mean, ha how do they work? There's a whole bunch of different ones um, for different parts of the syndrome. And remember, when somebody gets to me, it's usually because talking therapy by itself hasn't worked, so part of my job is medication. The basic ones, the antidepressants, are really cool. Stress literally fries your brain. It causes a breakdown in cell connections. 
What all the antidepressants do is their common mechanism of action is they trick the brain into making a repair hormone. And that repair hormone, which is called BDNF, starts getting those nerve cells to reconnect and grow back together. In doing that, the person's ability to make sense of their story improves. Now those things take two or three weeks to work. So saying to somebody, take this medication and wait two or three weeks before you get any change, I think is just mean. Because meantime, they're not sleeping, they've got nightmares, they're cranky, they're irritable and they're jumping out of their skin. So often we'll use anticonvulsants to set that down, or we'll use a blood pressure modi uh, modifying drug called Prazosin to settle that down. And it really is quite a knack to pick a cocktail of meds or even just one med for the right person. Sometimes we'll start with two, sometimes even three meds, and then a month later they'll be on one, six months to 12 months later, possibly on zero if all goes well. Okay, so let's get back to talking therapy, which you, you mentioned a bit before. Um, I'm sure it's got a, a professional name. Mm, heaps. <laughs> like, give us a few. Uh, acceptance commitment therapy, exposure therapy, cognitive behaviour therapy, psychodynamic psychotherapy. We could go on. I guess one of the important things is that in real clinical practice, it is unusual to stick to one particular therapy style. What we're doing is taking from all sorts of therapy styles to try to come up with a cocktail that's going to work with that particular person, the way they see things, the kinds of things that have happened. Two particular things come out. One is the trauma-focused therapy. Usually at some stage we're going to have to work through the trauma. We're going to have to work through the details of what happened. I guess in my experience that very rarely happens at the first um, uh, meeting. And you find different things that come up. You know, I remember a guy telling me that he didn't like people using their mobile phones. Because in Afghanistan, if somebody was using their mobile phone and pointing it at you, it meant you were likely to be about to be blown up and it was going to appear on YouTube. The other thing that comes up is acceptance commitment therapy. And this is a way, this is derived from Buddhism. And it's a nifty little notion that we learn to accept that bad things happen, that evil things happen, that you can't prevent all of them, and to realise to detach yourself from your emotions about that particular event. I guess one of the teachings of, of Buddhism that is kind of at the basis of that is what's called the first noble truth. There is suffering. Now, that always sounded like a cop-out to me. Didn't like it. Until I realised you had to put the is in bold and underline it. As a copper, you get a chance to ease suffering. You get a chance to save people, to help people. But you're not going to get a chance to save everybody. For that, you have to rely on your colleagues around the place. What other tricks have you got in your bag for post-traumatic stress disorder? You've got, you got drugs, you've got conversation? Conversation? Yeah. Well, I guess there's two tricks that come to mind. One is really fancy drugs, but let's get back to the, something that's more predictable and practical. <clears throat> One of the things I'm really happy with where I work in South Australia, and I know that the police here will fall about laughing when I say this, is that there's really good support from command a lot of the time. The police union support is really good. And my personal liaison with injury management here is really good. So one of the things that will happen is that I'll be seeing the guy very soon afterwards. I'll be talking with this rehabilitation professional. We'll be talking about time off work. We'll be talking about a re-entrance back to work. What we're looking at with the police, like any emergency grouping, is the support of the team, the validation of the team, particularly the validation from the commanding officer, and then gradually restructuring and rebuilding duties. Have, have a look at this <coughs> other bit from Dark Blue. Great. Department email. And then they trialled psych visits. I was thinking about it myself, but... Who wants to be seen going to the psych with the wobblies? Oh, God. Yeah. It wasn't the smartest idea they've ever had.
Hey, Grant. Grant, do you want to come out for coffee? Rain check. Okay, so the psychologist there in dark blue uh, is operating, you know, consulting in the police station. Probably not a brilliant idea, but nope. what was important for me there was the fact that Grant didn't seem to engage personally with the psychologist. He walked out the door, whatever it was he got, he threw it in the bin mm. and he walked away. How important is the relationship between, you know, the psychiatrist, the psychologist and the person with post-traumatic stress disorder? Really important. It's like going to the dentist with a sore tooth. The relationship is the local anaesthetic that enables that intense suffering to be contained like a crucible. So that relationship is really important. You may not meet the psychologist or psychiatrist that you're going to get on with first time, get on well with first time. Very often the GPs know they can match a particular person with a, with a particular doctor or psychiatrist. Psychologists within SAPOL um, or within police, they're there to perform a particular function because one of the things that you're dealing with when you're dealing with police like you are with soldiers is you're dealing with a highly valuable piece of kit that can do dangerous things and so you need to make sure that they're functioning. One of the things that's really important is for their treating professionals to advocate for the patient, to work for the patient, but simultaneously not to set up a combative relationship with the employer. Unless, of course, the employer sets up a combative relationship and once you're combative right back. Okay, so, um, again, let's have a look at this little bit from Dark Blue. I have to say, you're almost looking good. I mean, almost, no <laughs> quite. Almost. Yeah, almost. Thank you. You're welcome. That's what I'm here for. Yeah. <laughs> no more greys. Must have done you good, eh? Should we be trusting him yeah. with a loaded weapon? Speak to John, mate. Oh, got put to work, did Oh, I just bit around the garden. A bit of painting, but... Oh, yeah. Got to... That's fine. Sir. Should we be sending him out on patrol with a loaded weapon? He's uh, been a bit an edge lately. Yeah, I'll keep an eye on him. Thanks, sir. So, Grant has had a month off. Yep. Um, mental health mm. leave. And he comes back to work. Um, can he expect to get sick again? Um, if he's exposed to more stresses and traumas? Yes. It depends on the timing. It depends on the level of recovery. It's very much like the second concussion in sport. The first concussion, you don't send the guy back out there, even if he seems OK, because you know the brain is in a weakened state. That second concussion might be the one that kills or causes permanent brain injury. So one of the things that we're really conscious of with, um, with sending coppers back to work is making the duties as low-key as possible and gradually escalating until we get things right. Now, it's not always accurate. Sometimes things push a little bit too far and coppers tend to be very determined, ambitious people and they'll often like to push a little bit further than we're comfortable with. We need to accommodate that. There's a flexibility when we hit a wall we observe, we retract, we think about what happened and try and back off. You can't control stress exactly, but you can do the best you can. One of the worst things you can do, I think, is not let the copper progress. So actually overprotecting, cotton wooling can actually make things worse and build a state of chronic avoidance which leads to depression. So if I'm a cop and I've, you know, I'm being treated for post-traumatic stress disorder and I'm back at work, mm. um, uh, what kind of things can I do to kind of protect myself, fireproof myself from a recurrence? Things that I can do. In a work situation, I think it's really important to talk about the command and the team. Stuff that you can do by the time you've gotten back to work, you've usually got a repertoire of coping skills that are the kinds of things that you have done before. 
you're aware of relax relaxation strategies, you're aware of distraction strategies, you're aware possibly of the need to take some time out from time to time. One of the things that really helps is the support from the guys around you. This doesn't generally does not mean let's have a dear old heart to heart about the terrible things that have happened. It can just mean a cup of coffee or thanks for doing that. The command of being aware, keeping an eye on the guy just out of the back of his eye, sometimes regular meetings, but certainly not micromanagement. It's a very fluid process. Can understanding and education with regard to you know, mental health generally and post-traumatic stress disorder specifically, can that sort of protect you from getting post-traumatic stress disorder? Does that help at all? It won't stop it happening. Um, that's really a function of the individual, fatigue levels and the nature of the trauma. What it does do is makes recovery a lot easier. In a nutshell, I'm really big on it, education, which is one of the reasons we're doing this, this video, because it makes my job ultimately a lot easier. We know what the guy's dealing with. Um, had a bit of a great moment about four weeks ago where I was able to certify three guys back to work on the beginning stages of their journey in 24 hours. Now each of those guys had had symptoms for quite a long time, they'd seen a few psychologists over the years, they'd stayed at work and then there was just a stack up. They knew what they were dealing with, um, they were compliant with treatment and we were able to get some pretty good results very quickly. I remember um back to my little episode all those years ago, um, yep. it happened mm. that my GP was a mate and yeah. and uh, was sort of interested in this, so he kind of experimented on me. Yep. Um, but I got to him within about three or four weeks of, of yep. realising that I had an issue. Yes. And I remember thinking to myself, I sort of got over it pretty quickly, I, you know, comparatively mm. quickly, mm. Uh, and just moved back into life and it was, it was fine. Like I didn't mm. get over it, but I got past it. Mm. Um, so I suppose the, the, the lesson here is, is put your hand up early. The moment you think something's going wrong, you're not handling all, all that well, put your hand up, get some help. Is that the story? The earlier you get onto it, the better. Um, one of the things that we've seen increasingly over the past 20 years is that you often see the coppers at 50 plus, um, they were worn out, um, they had chronic depression, they had alcohol problems. Getting on top of that, fixing that was really very hard work, very often impossible. Now we're seeing guys presenting in their 20s or 30s with the kinds of things that they would have hidden by drinking or time off work or changing wives or changing husbands that they're actually getting on top of it's being treated earlier. And I know a lot of those guys have gotten back to work and resumed their careers. How do you reckon work cover and those return to work agencies are addressing post-traumatic stress disorder these days? I've got to be parochial here because I really only know South Australia and to an extent Tasmania a hell of a lot better than they did. It's become a lot more of a cooperative process. Uh, the rehabilitation people, the claims managers keep in touch with us. Very often what I'm doing is when I'm writing back to them, I'm copying the patient into the, the letters and the emails so they know exactly what's being done. So it becomes a very collaborative process. You know, sometimes there's awkwardness and you know, the message for doctors is the patient comes first. The patient is the one you're looking after, not the organisation. There are other areas, I'm not sure what it's like interstate. Um, I know in our group of about eight or nine psychiatrists, there is one insurer for federal um, bodies, um, the federal police, for example, that we will refuse to deal with. Why? <clears throat> Clunky, delayed administration problems, litigation that is often vicious and um, uh, slow and takes a long time. We know we're going to get a poor outcome. OK, um, if you were talking to the police ministers around Australia and, and the commissioners um, about work-induced psychological injuries, what would you tell them? Your coppers, he and she, are valuable pieces of kit. They cost you one fifty to $200,000 to train. So look after that valuable piece of kit. Um, when the copper, lady or male, becomes ill, look after them, help them get back to work and don't be so bothered about the possibility of malingering with PTSD or weakness. 
it is a normal finding. Often the best and brightest will go through this condition and they can be managed and treated back to health. Malingering in these situations is something that lawyers get bothered about. It's actually incredibly rare. If you're talking to a cop with mm. post-traumatic stress disorder and their family, mm. all in the one room at the same time, what yep. would you say? <clears throat> that we'll work hard to get this copper better, he or she. Now, with, with she's, there are often issues to do with kids um, and managing that and who's going to run the family. The other thing that comes up is what is the family going to do to provide support uh, to try and manage that? Now, this isn't just support of holding hands and protecting an individual, but how to encourage them to, to move on. The family needs to know what's being done with the copper and why it's being done. So explanation. So you're really trying to form a team from the get-go. OK. Thanks, Nick. Have you got any final observations to make that we haven't, haven't covered? I think it's a really exciting time for managing psychiatric disorders. There's a whole bunch more science to it, a whole bunch more knowledge. Um, there are a whole bunch of new medications that are coming, possibly coming online, the ketamines and the hallucinogens and the MDMA, which have been considered by the TGA at the moment. I think the thing that really helps is having command support, command awareness, and remembering that your copper is a valuable piece of kit. Thanks, Nick. I joined the force at about the same time Grant did. There's nothing you can do, sweet. Grant. Coffee? No. Should we be trusting him with a loaded weapon? He's uh, been a bit an edge lately. Can you shut your mouth? I'm trying to get this under control here. Don't talk to me. I now need you to come back to the police Mate, station. Suck and jack it, you idiot. You're a risk, Grant. You're a risk to yourself and everyone around you. It was dark, mate. Anyone could have made the same mistake. It's what I wrote in my report. Grant! They never said it would be like this. <laughs>